Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. My name is Camden Busey. I'm in Grays Lake, Illinois, here at uh, the Reform Forum studio, and very excited to be back uh, with another episode today to, to open up onto a subject that's very important to us confessional Presbyterians, in, in particular, talking about the Westminster Confession of Faith and, and to some degree, the Assembly uh, as a whole. And I have a very special guest with me today, welcoming to the program for the very first time, Dr. John R. Bauer, who actually serves as a, an MD. Uh, uh, he is a pediatric infectious disease specialist at uh, the Children's Hospital of Akron, but uh, most of you will know him as a co-editor of the principal documents of the Westminster Assembly, uh, published by Reformation Heritage Books, editing along with our good friend Chad Van Dixhorn. Welcome to the program, Dr. Bauer. It's great to see you today. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Thank you, Ken. You bet. I'm excited to, to speak with you and to open up uh, particularly to what I believe is the newest volume. Uh, we're talking about the Confession of Faith, properly speaking, uh, because you've you've worked on and now uh, Reformation Heritage Books has produced and, and published the critical text and an introduction. So this volume is, is tremendous. It com- comes alongside the volume on the larger catechism and on the other documents as well. And uh, I couldn't be I couldn't be happier to discuss this with you today. So thanks for joining us. Um, I look forward. Now, um, I guess we could start off right out of the uh, gate. I mean, I would like to refer people to many of our uh, previous episodes on the Westminster Assembly. We've talked to uh, Chad about uh, the confession in terms of its theology and content. We've uh, discussed uh, the Westminster, the papers and the minutes of the Westminster Assembly to some degree. So I'll place links in the episode description to those. So we don't need to rehearse everything for people. But just to get up to speed a little bit, I was wondering if you could provide us just a thumbnail sketch of just the general contours of the history of the Westminster Assembly, just so that we can get our minds and listeners can get our uh, their minds in the in the right place to understand the 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 research that you've done here in producing a critical edition. How did the Westminster Assembly come about, and and what were they tasked to do? Yeah, the Westminster Assembly was a, a unique time in the history of the Reformation. As we think about the 17th century, as it dawned uh, in England, especially the Reformation had really, while it had taken place. Uh, it, earlier that uh, century, as we move into from the 1500s, it, it would never really achieved completion. Uh, what the Westminster Assembly provided was for, as they referred to, a further and more perfect Reformation. Mm. For over the decades leading up to the Reformation or, or to the Assembly, what had occurred was uh, certainly dissatisfaction being expressed among the godly uh, in the Church of England, looking for reform. Uh, they met with opposition. Uh, from the church, uh, largely through uh, figures such as Archbishop William Laud. Um, but all of this is being reflected uh, through uh, King Charles I. Uh, it is his uh, administration, so to speak, in which uh, this is all taking place. Uh, so now we're calling for reform. And that voice for reform is growing louder and louder as we move into the 1640s, uh, as the decade of the 1640s starts. Um, all of a sudden, Parliament, which is much more sympathetic to the godly or the Puritan sim- uh, movement, is calling for reform and has a much more powerful voice for a variety of reasons. The king must listen to a certain degree. And so they get their foot in the door. And one of the key elements they wanted to see as they negotiated with the king for changes in, in England, not only political, but also ecclesiastical. And so one of those changes was to let's reform the church based on a convocation or a synod of, of clergy from out, throughout the nation to help advise and to direct this reform. Well, the king certainly, uh, among many other things that, that uh, parliament posed, refused. Yeah. Uh, what this finally led to uh, for a variety of reasons, but not to underestimate the, the importance of religion in trans in, in uh, initiating what came to be the English Civil War. Um, but it did take place. So as the English Civil War was now raging, Parliament had its ability to now unilaterally bring into effect all those reforms that they were seeking earlier uh, from Charles. And what was one of the key ones? Reforming the church. What do we need to do that? We need to bring advisors. And those advisors are clergy within the Church of England, throughout the Church of England. Uh, and, and so Parliament issued an invitation. Uh, it was accepted uh, by uh, 
nearly over a hundred uh, um, clergy throughout the nation. Uh, they assembled in 1643 and were handed the task of reform. And so this became the great power uh, of, of the assembly was its power of advising and its ability to have a hand in putting together not only a confession, but all the other documents that were necessary to reestablish the Church of England. Because remember, like many churches in the prior century of Reformation, what took place when, when a city or a state declared for Reformation, we recast the entire church. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a new confession, new forms of worship, new forms. All of these things were necessary to bring an identity to that Reformation church. And it's no different here. Uh, as the assembly is called, they're called to provide that wide landscape ecclesiastically to supply the church. Mm -hmm. But as we'll talk about, the confession becomes the key to that plan. Mm. There's certainly an, an enormous amount of, of uh, information here to, to, to keep in mind regarding the history and the development of it. But even when we're looking specifically at the text, um, as we talk about the critical text that you have produced, it's also important to recognize the other confessional documents. So it's from one perspective, uh, it's interesting to consider the use of the 39 articles and the Irish articles, not let alone even the development of the documents that the assembly produced on their own. Correct. You know, we have to see the assembly, uh, their work was not conducted in a vacuum by any sense. They were much in touch with what was going on in the continent. They understood their place within the reformed uh, tradition. And as they set to work, uh, they took very seriously their place uh, in the reform landscape. And so, yes, there's going to be attention paid uh, to uh, many different influences. But especially, as you might expect, this being an English synod, they're going to start with the English documents or those that have much more of an English origin, and that being the 39 articles and the Irish articles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those have, those have been the occasion for... Uh... Much uh, scholarly discourse, even leading up to this, and I imagine now with the proliferation or the the, the wonderful gift we have here in uh, all of this new scholarship and research in the last decade, uh, going to produce even more studies. Now, truly, you have produced what I think many people, no doubt, will will end up calling or at least viewing as a definitive critical edition of this confessional text. But just more generally speaking about a critical text, what is the importance of this kind of, of research, of this historical and editorial work for the church today? Why is it important to engage in, in work of this nature? Yeah, as we consider the value of a critical text such as the Westminster Confession of Faith, you know, we begin by just understanding the value, value of critical texts generally. Uh, whenever we have an important, uh, valuable and as in this case, authoritative text, we want to make sure that we're operating with the most accurate edition. Um, everything's predicated on accuracy. Uh, once we make it authoritative, we want to make sure that there's no, uh, that everyone's moving together in sync and, uh, and that there's no disagreements as to uh, what the source is. And so we want that single source of truth, basically as we come to understand the confession. Um, as, and where do we find that? We find that right. in the authors. And who are the authors? Typically, uh, books have a single author. In this case, we have scores of authors. Uh, so how do we gauge what is the intent, the authorial intent of the assembly? Well, we come back and just say, it's the assembly working together and expressing its, its view uh, in the final text. And one of the key elements we have for gauging the involvement of the assembly in the final text is the role of its scribes. The scribes were given particular authority, both by the assembly and by parliament, to be the ones who are uh, overseeing the, the printing of the confession to make sure it's accurate and that it reflects exactly uh, what the assembly intended. And so uh, a critical text now is, is an opportunity to step back and make sure we've looked at all those editions, all those authoritative editions in which the scribes had a hand in order to step back and say, what is the text uh, that is most accurate? Mm -hmm. and, and we approach this a couple of different ways, but one of the, the, the reasons that we want to, again, be sure that we look at the text in its, you know, in its fullness is understanding that there are subtleties to text. Uh, it's not just simply, are all the words correct? 
or are all the proof text correct? Uh, there are other things that can come into play that we have to at least pay attention to as we look at the text authoritatively. And uh, that is things, simple things, spelling, capitalization, but especially grammar. Uh, we, we sometimes want to simply transliterate punctuation from the 17th century into the 21st century. Uh, that's not necessarily something that can be done without some careful thought. And that thought has to begin, though, with the original intent. So we want to be able to have a text that gives us each of those fine details so that as we now take this authoritative text and try to communicate it beyond the ecclesiastical courts, how can we do that most accurately and with the fullest agreement? And that is, let's go back to the source. Mm. And a great example of this is from the assembly itself. When it began work uh, in 1643, as it first convened, uh, the task that they were handed was the 39 articles. Let's revise them. And so as they started the work, the very first step they took, though, was to appoint a committee to make sure they identified the most accurate texts upon which they could work. Because they knew for them to proceed beyond that point would be fruitless unless they were working with the most accurate texts. So this is a bonus question before I ask some more serious questions, but there are scholars out there working uh, in the 17th century. And do you have any tips for uh, scholars of the sort working with 17th century spelling in the age of computer autocorrect? <laughs> Turn it off. <laughs> right? It must be maddening to try to write this and the computer is always fighting against you. Yes, yes. There's a learning curve that you go through, and uh, and uh, and uh, in which you find that autocorrect is your is your enemy. Yeah, I imagine. So, speaking of authoritative texts, though, people might. I mean, this might be new to some folks because we just we have a Westminster Confession of Faith. Hasn't it always been that way? Like, did, don't, wasn't it printed once, and now we just have it? But you're working with even four different authoritative texts. Can you describe those to us and, and maybe a little bit of their origins and uh, differences? When we talk about those texts in which, again, the scribes were given specific oversight of and to ensure accurate printing, um, we have actually three printed texts and one manuscript text. The manuscript, quite often we view the manuscript, well, that should be the obvious source of authority. Uh, but what we find actually is that the assembly continue making some tweaks uh, in the text, even beyond the manuscript. So that takes us to our first printed edition. Well, the first printed edition was actually only a partial copy of the of the confession. It reached only through the first 19 chapters. The second printed edition was the full text of the confession, but no proof text. The final edition of the confession, the fourth edition, uh, that we consider authoritative was the one that had both the text and the, the complete text and the complete proof text. But there's a difference. Uh, the third edition, the intent was to ensure we had the proper text. Emphasis was placed on the text. The, the next edition, though, the one that included the proof text, emphasis was on the proof text. So when we look at really what is the intent of the assembly, we actually have a, an amalgam of two different editions. We have the text from the second edition, the second full printed edition, and we have the proof text from the third edition. So what re that requires then is as we create this critical text, it actually becomes a conflation of two texts. But this, that's important because when we see how difficult it is to incorporate the apparatus for proof text within the third edition, um, it's clear that the printers had, a, had, a, had their mind on something other than re replicating the accuracy of the second edition. Mm. They needed to be able to accommodate uh, the reference letters within the text, and there was shifting in the text. So we know that, you know, as we think about these two uh, versions, we, we have the luxury uh, that they didn't of being able to step back and, and, and uh, create this, this uh, combination. I imagine people would be interested in the mechanics of, of how this worked. I really loved uh, your specific chapter on uh, that you titled From Manuscript to Press, but then also the chapter after it on bibliographic details. 
Um, could you describe uh, some of these features that are that are useful in in uncovering the research that is necessary? Because some folks might say, well, we have one printed edition, so as long as I have a copy of that, I'm good to go. I know what that edition said, but you describe something called a stop press variant, which makes it even more complicated where you have to do some extra legwork even to find out what what that printed edition meant, even if you have a copy. This is very true. Um, being able to uh, step back and look at these authoritative editions requires more than just simply a resource to a single copy. Because as you alluded to, there's this process called the step pro stop, stop press variant uh, in which the printer would set up the type and would begin printing. And they'd be printing away. Meanwhile, somebody would take one of the sheets and start reading it. And as they would start reading it, they, if they found an error, they would stop the press, open up the form, change, make the correction, re, uh, tighten the form, and then continue printing. But in the meantime, depending on how serious uh, uh, an error it was, they often would let it go unchanged. So you could have several different types of uh, changes introduced into the single, a single edition of, uh, of a work. And so we see this, um, uh, in things like the larger catechism, uh, we uh, identified several stop press variants uh, in that work, uh, which you would not find if you looked at a single copy. So that, that really introduces one of the more tedious parts of uh, multiple copies of each text. And you have to look at multiple copies, character for character, and just to make sure that you're not seeing these subtle changes nor can you rely on photocopies or even photographic images, because sometimes it's a matter of actually looking at the patina of the page and, and uh, whether or not there is an impress on the page that could reveal uh, simply lack of ink uh, versus a true change. So these are little details that are necessary and able to be able to make that, that assertion you know, that this is the text as it was uh, presented uh, by the assembly. And your critical edition here, we can talk uh, further about the way it's laid out in a minute, but it certainly has an apparatus and you've included these notes. So it's not as if we just have the text, this is the best critical text, period. But much like we have with critical editions of the Greek New Testament, for example, there's an apparatus that describes the differences and then you provide a grading as to which is most likely to be the, the correct or most authoritative, right? Correct. And, you know, again, this is the, the importance of providing a critical text because it is not to simply impose an addition. It's to engage uh, those who are involved in with the text uh, so that when we see variations between additions, when we make changes or introduce changes, we want to make sure that the reader is fully aware of, of what changes that were made and why they were made. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. That's the usefulness of having this edition now from Reformation Heritage Books. Um, I'm tremendously interested, I know our listeners will be as well, about the 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 interactions of the assembly, uh, because it's helpful to know how the, how the, the text developed over time. I mean, in terms of the Westminster Confession of Faith, its content being debated and drafted, edited, and then, and then finally approved, and then eventually even published and then disseminated. What different committees were at work? And you've already mentioned scribes. What, what different types of people were involved in this massive process over the years? You know, I think the, the first level of involvement has to get to the members of the assembly themselves. Uh, you remember, this is uh, a, a process in which uh, we would go through stages. There were uh, the members of the assembly were themselves divided into three different standing committees. And so you were a member of the, of the assembly, you were assigned to a particular one of these three standing committees. So the way the assembly was composed was by assigning headings or, or titles uh, to the various uh, committees and calling for them to bring a draft proposal to the floor of the assembly for debate. And so the first step was that subcommittee or that standing committee and that standing committee uh, again, would typically be composed of anywhere from 20 to 30 uh, members at any given time. Uh, what they would do then is uh, together would uh, bring to the assembly their draft. Uh, 
Um, they would read the draft before the, the floor of the assembly as, as all members were convened, and then debate would trans, you know, aspire. And, uh, and in that course, um, it would then be modified on the floor of the assembly based on the votes and whether or not there were any amendments proposed. And then it would either be recommitted for change, further changes in consideration, it would be approved, it would be amended, one of those possibilities. If it was approved, it then moved on to the wording committee. Uh, this wording committee uh, was probably the most significant uh, contributor to the, to the confession of faith as we know it today. Wow. Uh, much of the, the beauty and, and the symmetry of the confession of faith, we have to give credit to the wording committee uh, for it because it was a daunting task at times because here you had on average 70 different uh, cler clerics arguing on the floor of the assembly. <laughs> you had uh, multiple committees creating their own reports. Um, the, the opportunity for there being a, a wide variety of, of, of changes and nuance differences uh, was, was really quite real. So trying to bring consistency to such a wide variety of, of, of individuals and, and uh, writing styles uh, was an important uh, part of the wording committee. And so they, they were given that task and, and it was, again, phenomenal how much uh, they would sometimes bring to bear on the, the final text, mm. um, which again shows that there was considerable amount of latitude given to the wording committee uh, in bringing about the final uh, version. But yet, in the end, every change made by the wording committee had to again be brought before the assembly, read and approved by the whole. Wow. What evidence uh, presently exists that we still have, evidence that you could consult uh, of these changes uh, in terms of documents, minutes? What, how, do you, how do you uncover this? Yes, and, and this is where the minutes of the Westminster Assembly uh, are, in, are, are vital. Uh, this is where uh, Chad's contribution uh, to scholarship within the Westminster Assembly in the 17th century at large uh, is, 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 it's hard to, to really uh, uh, give it due um, mm -hmm. in, in the sense of its importance. Uh, you can make no pronouncement on the assembly without that at hand, those minutes. And it's not just the minutes. Um, one of the great benefits that we have are the other documents that uh, were composed by the assembly. Once again, uh, a, a, uh, an opportunity uh, for understanding that Chad has really introduced uh, uniquely uh, in his edition of the minutes. Um, moreover, we can find you know, other ways in which uh, we can see the way the assembly engaged with one another uh, because discussions were not confined to the Jerusalem chamber. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they would break out into public and the best public venue was the press. And so we would find works often uh, being printed in which one assembly member is vying with another or oh, one group wow. versus another. So this was uh, another way in which we could, again, get a sense of what the dynamic was uh, on the assembly floor. Are you aware of any historical sources that at one time existed, but that perhaps have been lost or destroyed for various reasons, we don't have them now, uh, that you really wish that you could have consulted? Oh, I think uh, without a doubt, there are an enormous number of resources. Um, interestingly, in 1650, uh, John Milton, who was Secretary of State at the time, was given the task of creating an inventory of all the documents related to the assembly. Unfortunately, mm. that's maybe one document I wish we had that's yeah. lost. Wow. Um, because we don't know what we don't know uh, in the sense of what documents were out there. That would have given us a great insight but we can certainly speculate about what other possibilities there are. One of them being uh, certainly um, there were the books of votes, uh, which the scribes would record uh, who voted, who was there. Uh, the, a great deal of routine was, was uh, rolled into those uh, books of votes uh, that I wish we had. So undoubtedly, these, the committee reports and the minutes of committees existed. Um, where those went, we don't know. Mm. Um, but but they almost certainly existed. Uh, many of the original manuscripts we've lost. Um, yes, there's a 
there's a whole uh, library full of uh, missing documents that would certainly give a great more a great deal of insight into what we uh, have thus far. Mm. Well, who knows what we may find in years to come, even if it uh, happens to be people's journals or diaries or wh- whatever it is, it'd be interesting to see. And that's uh, work yes. that lies ahead. Yes. And it's easy to think that in our age of of uh, having everything at our fingertips, that, that it's impossible for us to miss anything. But there are still uncatalogued libraries out there in which some documents may exist. Absolutely. Well, let's speak a bit about the, the process of seeing this unfold historically, because when we're looking at the critical text of this sort, and you're analyzing all of these different historical sources, we come to see the striations of, of the text and, and, the, and its content. I'm, I'm curious, what kinds of things do we learn when we start to see how the confession of faith started to take shape? It's an, almost a, an anal, analogous kind of task to, to biblical theology versus systematic theology. We're not only looking at the final product as a whole— but also looking at how it came to be over time. Yeah, I think as we consider the the sort of the, the coalescence of the document as we go over time, uh, one of the key elements here that, that goes into that is the outline of the confession. Uh, the outline was one of the very first things the assembly composed. It was composed quite literally uh, with a day's notice uh, for the committee to present what should be the headings to be included. And remarkably, the headings that were supplied uh, to the assembly by the committee were essentially the same headings that we have in the final confession. Oh, wow. There were very little changes that, that were affected over time, other than maybe some rearrangement. Uh, the only real changes that we had were the addition of three new chapters, which I think potentially were, were intended to the table at first and were only uh, admitted, uh, admitted later on. Huh. So there's remarkable consistency, at least to the overall shape of the confession as it as it came to be. That's tremendous to know. Uh, what, what aspects of the confession of faith received the most debate and change, and, and what, what received the least? Uh, I think our listeners would be interested to know what was the most contentious, and also what seem to be dealt with early on right away and not too many people had too many issues with it. Yeah, I think the again the the interesting thing about the debate of the assembly is the fact that it took place sequentially pretty much. Uh there wasn't a prioritization given to certain headings. It was simply let's begin with scripture and let's end uh with the the, the final judgment. Um and as you do so we'll see a, occasional uh, reconfigurations, but but overall that was the the approach. But as we move through that, uh, sometimes progress was rapid. Uh, certainly in the first uh, two chapters, there was very little discussion. But when we came to the decrees, that really was probably the biggest doctrinal issue that would uh, up, you know would engage the assembly. Um, and uh, and you know as as we can see there were there were several issues that uh, were important concerning the decrees, um, but one of the interesting things I I, I I see as I look at that debate was the fact that um, it actually involved more than one chapter. Mm. The, the discussion on the decrees also engaged uh, chapter eight on Christ. Oh yeah, um, because we have to be talking about Christ as Redeemer dying for the elect, um, and so as we look at God. Uh, giving to Christ uh, the elect, um, e- you know, eternally, uh, we see this close, as uh, Gillespie uh, commented on, this close concatenation between the decrees in Christ, and uh, so uh, that was a, a, a fascinating uh, a time in which we gained a lot of insight, mm. not only about the assembly, uh, but about the members themselves and how they engaged with one another. Certainly, also with. Um... The doctrine of justification, I'm thinking off the top of my head of 11.4, and this uh, denouncement of a rejection of an eternal justification, it's certainly within within the scope there. Did you find any evidence, or is there reason to believe that, I guess this could go one of two ways, that as the members work together more, that they started to work uh, better together, that things started to be a little bit more... Um, I don't know, smooth as it went along, or 
perhaps as they started to get to know each other more and and uh, started to have more relations with each other they started to get a little bit more <laughs> more animated and fiery with one another i guess the the question to ask is how did their relationship working relationship develop over time and is that evidenced at all in the documents i think it's one of the key elements is uh, that it's important to remember when we talk about work on the confession is is that there was work on the first confession which was essentially the 39 articles um, this is how the assembly began. And oftentimes the 39 articles are portrayed simply as, as time marching, that the members of the assembly were just waiting for the Solemn League and Covenant to introduce a whole new model for church reform. Therefore, let's just have some busy work. Uh, and, you know, I think that's clearly uh, failing to take into account uh, some of the, the great contributions made by the assembly's debates on the 39 articles. But one of the key ones is simply just that, because from the very beginning, the assembly was given the task of debating within confessional boundaries, a confessional context. Here was the opportunity to share, which would be the broadest platform of consensus among the assembly. Yeah, we're going to have differences in worship. We're going to have differences in government. But when it comes to doctrine, there's an incredible amount of agreement and unanimity among the members. So this is an opportunity to build those kinds of friendships, those kinds of relationships to establish that rapport within a context of trying to reach agreement that is feasible. And uh, so this was an important first step, I think, for the assembly that translated into the confession, because not only did they establish the ground rules for debate and the opportunities on how to um, debate confessionally, uh, but they also uh, brought with them, you know, much of experience uh, on doctrines they've already dealt with. Take justification, for instance. Obviously, as we look at uh, the debates on justification, uh, it was a tremendous effort when they worked through uh, Article 11 of the 39 Articles. But when it came to the Assembly's work on the Confession, it went through rather quickly, mm. rather uh, uneventfully. Why? Because they had already worked through those issues and knew where they agreed and where they disagreed. And uh, it gave them just the opportunity to move forward more quickly. Hmm. Now, obviously, this side of, of such a tremendous work with so much effort has, that has been expended, uh, you can look back, I imagine, with some perspective and uh, see things differently than you may have seen them coming in. And I know any any major project, even, whether that's an article all the way up to a book, you certainly learn things in the process. What might you say that you learned uh, in the process of working on this critical text? And was anything surprising to you that you didn't expect? You, I think I look at that two ways. One is the text itself. Anything surprising. Um, and I think what's surprising is, is again, how well done it was, the original text. Uh, they took a great deal of care. We alluded to the stop press variants earlier. Um, there was a single stop press variant in the three editions of the confession. Wow. Um, they worked at this and were very accurate in their, in their efforts. And, and interestingly, the single stop press variant was simply taking the word Adam, which had been italicized, and rendering it into a non-italicized form. <laughs> oh goodness! But but that could, took considerable time yeah. to do. But but again, that little almost trivial uh, instance really gives us a, a, an insight into how seriously they took uh, their work. They wanted to make sure that the word Adam was consistently portrayed throughout the text. Now, would the assembly having it willy nilly? Would the wording committee have made notes about that to the typographer on whether or not? No, that would have simply been a convention, probably introduced by the the uh, typesetter. Um, sure. But the but the scribes looked at it and said, "No, they didn't like it. That's not what we want. <laughs> um, we want consistency, and that's our task." And so they they go. So that's that's one thing. I think the other thing is as we look at the as we look at the the uh, the the, um, the doctrinal aspect of the of the work is really the importance and how central Christian liberty was uh, to the confession and to the assembly itself. You know, Christian liberty um, in many ways was the, the 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 great driver 
Uh, because if we think about the whole plan that was taking place, why was the assembly there? It was to create a model of the church in doctrine, worship, and government that would be applied to everyone within the church, and not only within the Church of England, but also for Scotland and Ireland. And so uniformity of religion was at the heart of the confession of faith. And the confession was offering the greatest, the best foundation for building that uniformity, uh, since it would also be the one that would be able to garner the greatest amount of support and agreement. Um, so as we see the, the confession and uh, bringing about, you know, it, it was important that we understand that it was Christian liberty that was driving uniformity of religion. Uh, that seems rather uh, uh, counterintuitive. Uh, we, we tend to think the other way around. But if we, uh, if we go back and understand Christian liberty within the context of the assembly, Christian liberty was understood as it's not what I'm free to do. It's what has Christ called me to do? And what has he called me to do not only for him directly, but also for those within his church? So Christian liberty now all of a sudden is not about freedom of conscience from outside, but it's just a matter of what other outside influences and, and authorities exist that have a claim upon my conscience. And that's what the, the assembly was working on so diligently, was trying to bring into focus what are all the different authorities that exist uh, ecclesiastically, civilly, and also just by virtue of living in society to our neighbor? How did all these various forces um, that are God-ordained and instituted also put claims upon our conscience as we serve? And this was so important. So the whole idea of being able to gather together as a church in, uniform, in, in unanimity, uh, in worship, et cetera, is all an expression of Christian liberty, i.e. we are freed by Christ to serve him alone and his church. Wow. Do you do you have the sense that the members of the assembly, and then I guess beyond that, members of the churches, that they were satisfied with the document in its final form? That they felt the sense of Christian unity, even confessing the same text? You know, I think in terms of the, the confession of faith, I think there was broad satisfaction, uh, considerable satisfaction with what they created. Um, and, and I think that was, was even acknowledged by their enemies, was that this was a document uh, that was um, a, of a considerable uh, importance. Um, so I think as we, at the end of the day, yes, there was a, a great deal of, of satisfaction. Now, as we look at the debates, we know that there was certainly disagreement. And many times that disagreement was accommodated uh, within the, uh, the confession. And certainly individually, there are going to be those who would probably um, cringe at some of those accommodations, perhaps, that were made after their very um, uh, close arguments were made on the floor of the assembly. But, but at the end of the day, everybody came back and continued to work on the next chapter. Uh, this mm -hmm. was simply all about uh, trying to uh, bring the truths as clearly and, and concisely as possible uh, uh, before the church. Uh, but at the same time, bringing as much of the church together as they could. Yeah, some, this is, in a sense, the true beauty of Presbyterianism and the connectedness and the accountability. But what we see in deliberative assemblies, how the minority uh, still has rights and protections, has a voice, and it can be frustrating, maddening at times to to be involved in it, but it's it's such a beautiful thing when all of those um, rights are protected, and the church can come together and produce something that people can can get behind, even if it isn't word for word what they might have written on their own. They can be confident that it's the product of of the corporate of the body. Correct. Yes. Hmm. Uh, are there any details or things that uh, that you think are of particular note that that uh, the listeners and viewers of this program would really be interested to hear? Well, I, I think one of the things that that that's important to talk about when we look at the confession is we we look at the text, we look at the doctrines, we discuss them, but stepping back and taking that that higher level view of the confession, 
you know, if we scratch below the words themselves, what, what, what do we uncover? And, you know, and there's, and there's certainly elements to the confession that have a much more foundational nature uh, that, that are incorporated or implicit in, in each of the uh, chapters. You know, and again, it's as you, as you alluded to, it is the fact that the confession establishes um, the, the mind of the church and, and holds it fast. So we are not uh, going to be cast about. We're not going to be subject to whims and 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 uh, and fads. Uh, you know, the church protects uh, itself and and those within it. Um, and the confession becomes a, a very powerful tool for helping with that. Um, and we see that just in a variety of different ways. You know, if we if we, if we think about um, the emphasis on the church itself, that's implicit in the confession. You know, we go back to the 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 great forgotten solo of the Reformation, sola ecclesia, um, is, is the church is critical as we understand uh, the, the kingdom of Christ. Um, it is that visible manifestation. And so the, the importance of the uh, church uh, within the confession can't be underestimated. Um, and, uh, and, and so we, we certainly want to see how everything really gravitates around the church uh, as we look at the work of the assembly, obviously. Um, you know, a variety of other things that we think about, you know, as we as we look at the, uh, um, you know, the nature of its, you know, the system of faith that it presents. You know, we have that division of the confession of faith and life. You know, it's it's what is our, you know, the, the shorter catechism gives us that that nice, succinct description of not only the confession of faith, but all of the prior major confessions of the Reformation mm-hmm. and even down to the Apostles Creed itself. What are the two great aspects? It is uh, faith in God and service to God in the church. And uh, so the confession provides us that, that basic structure uh, as it leads us along that path. Um, so, yeah, variety of other things that we can see as we look underneath the surface of the confession that give us this big picture of, of what it does and how it does it. Oh, it's tremendous. You know, I encourage people to take a look at this. There's so many things to look at. Uh, and we haven't even talked much about the the comparisons of the text. But if you if you get a copy here from Reformation Heritage Books, we not only have the critical text of the confession, its apparatus, which also includes all of the, the proof texts, the scripture proofs, but then also a comparison of the four major authoritative texts. So you can read those side by side. It's a tremendous volume to have in addition to this book length introduction to the entire thing that we've been discussing uh, in, in this conversation. But one, we, over the years, we've had plenty of, of, of doctors on the program, but they're doctors of theology, uh, different people that have engaged in uh, theological study. Now, you have engaged in, in significant formal theological study yourself, uh, nevertheless working as a, as a medical doctor. And I'm wondering if you have any encouragement or thoughts uh, for those who would like to pursue theological scholarship and uh, perhaps someday dream of producing articles or books, uh, definitely of this quality and this magnitude, yet they might work full-time in a different field. Um, What words might you have for somebody such as yourself who have been able to do this, and yet other people looking at from the outside in, wondering how it might be done? Yeah, I think it's um, it's, it's certainly, um, you know, being uh, guided by your 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 passions and mm-hmm. your interests, um, it is um, you know it is it is a life in which uh, we have many choices about what we do with our time, and uh, it's a matter of simply assigning those priorities and but keeping those priorities in place, you know, family and work. But yet there is still opportunity, and and I think much of what we have to do is is trying to bring as much as we can uh, a focus to our work. You know, for those of us who do engage outside uh, in a more avocation type of, of, of effort, uh, it is about uh, trying to stay focused. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, being able to have uh, influences, um, again, I would uh, give a considerable, uh, um, you know, part of, of what I've been able to achieve through the assistance of others, uh, notably Chad. Um, this is something that, you know, we have to rely on others, maybe a little more, uh, to accomplish these things. And so reaching out and uh, looking for opportunities and venues, uh, but, but the best venue really is, is through more, um, uh, systematic study, 
And, and I would encourage those who are thinking of doing things like this is to uh, begin uh, with uh, trying to as assemble the credential. Um, and uh, whether it be a, uh, an MAR or a, a THM, uh, these are within reach, especially with the online capacities we have today. Yeah, it always helps to have a purpose and intent and uh, to stay focused on that. And, and really, I mean, take inventory of where your time and, and energy is going and not compromise the things that uh, you shouldn't compromise, such as your family, church involvement, all that sort of thing. But there's, there is a lot of time in the day that goes unaccounted for many of us, <laughs> uh, myself included. Uh, just look at my Netflix uh, account, you know. There's a lot of things that we can cut and uh, focus on things that uh, might have more enduring value. Well, speaking of enduring value, I can't thank you enough, uh, John, for taking the time to speak with me today and share this with our listeners, but more significantly, all the effort involved in producing this critical text and in, in co-editing this entire series on the principal documents of the Westminster Assembly. Thank you for your work and thank you for your time today. Well, thanks for this opportunity to talk about uh, what is, I think, uh, again, uh, uh, something that's been uh, a great uh, enjoyment to me and, uh, and hopefully uh, uh, some help to others. I think so. I think it'll be a tremendous benefit to other people. But I encourage uh, folks to head on over to Reformation Heritage Books. I'll include links again in the episode description so that you can get a copy not only of this, The Confession of Faith, The Critical Text, and Introduction, uh, but also the other volumes in the series. They're all tremendous. They're all beautiful, wonderfully laid out. Love the work that Reformation Heritage does. Good aesthetic. And speaking of uh, type, they have very nice and, and excellent typesetters using good fonts and good materials. They love books at Reformation Heritage Books, so we uh, are thankful for that. So you can head on over to reformedforum.org for information on that, as well as information on our other programs and uh, courses and other things available online. And I do want to thank everybody for listening. We hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.